symposium of the day, Vietnam Medical Care, um, Vietnam Care versus Today's Care Then and Now. Uh, the symposium is a panel comprised of Vietnam medics, nurses, as well as past Purple Heart and Silver Star recipient, a commander of the Navy, the National Navy Medical Center, and a major general of the U.S. Army. I will go in order from here. Uh, this is Bob D. Maria. He's the administrator of Mount Vernon Nursing Home and Rehab Center. During Vietnam, he served with the Army Motion Picture Services Department, capturing the medical response during the evacuation and field hospital treatment. Next to him is Chet Zaborowski, <laughs> special education teacher at Council Rock High School and a retired U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret. During Vietnam, he was assigned to the 5th Special Forces Group as a medic running top secret missions. Next is Lieutenant Colonel Narcy Martin, excuse me, Marcy Neuendorf, a retired Army nurse who served as an operating room nurse in the field hospital. Uh, Christina Kaufman is the executive director of the Code Support Foundation currently supporting the men, women, and families who return from the battlefield only to find a different kind of battle zone at home. And then, of course, at the end is our uh, Executive Director of Navy Marine Coast Guard Residence Foundation, Rear Admiral Kathleen Martin, who is also the CEO of Vincent Hall Retirement Community. Currently, she serves on the Defense Health Care Committee focused on the sustainment and advancement of AMBT care. Welcome. Thank you. And, uh, I think Admiral Martin's going to sort of moderate for us. We're going to start it off um, with Bob D. Maria, uh, taking us back to 1966 and then 67 when he went into Vietnam. Uh, Thank you, Admiral. Can you all hear me? I think I can hear you. Good. I, I want to first say <clears throat> I'm very happy to be back at a place I consider home. I spent 14 years as the administrator at Ollie Burke Pavilion, 14 of the best years of my career in, in, in long-term care. Just a wonderful place and I don't know, one of these days I, I threatened to come back and become president of the Residence Council and, <laughs> and enjoy myself greatly there. Um, I uh, graduated from Providence College in uh, June of 1966. And in July, found myself at Fort Sam Houston. I had decided that um, it was time to leave Providence, Rhode Island. Fond memories of Newport, Jamestown, and places like that, Quonset. But I was ready to strike out and see the world. And so I had an interest in, in medical administration. I uh, went through ROTC. And um, as I say, in, graduated in June and July, there I was down in Fort Sam Houston for my office's basic training. In September, I had been assigned to the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, rare as we called it, on the, uh, uh, the grounds of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And one of the divisions was the office of the secretary and one of the departments was the Department of Audiovisual Services, which made all of the medical training films for doctors, nurses, corpsmen, medics, who um, were going uh, in, in, into service and uh, were either going overseas. So for all of those training films that Chet had to sit through, as he was telling me earlier, and anyone else that had to sit through medical training films, it probably came out of out of that department. What was happening in 1967 is the war was was winding, winding not not down but winding up. Were that we were sending uh, six man teams to Vietnam for three to six months to shoot just anything and everything uh, applicable to to medical care, medical services from the field hospitals in, in all the large cities in the South to uh, the, the combat evacuation zones um, in, on the front lines for, um, for helicopter evacuations. Uh, 
what would, we would do is we would shoot and shoot and shoot. We used Araflex 16 millimeter cameras and uh, Nikon and Can Canon uh, 35 millimeter uh, slide, slide uh, uh, cameras. And we would just shoot whatever we could relative to, to, the, uh, to the medical um, effort, which included going into the operating rooms, <coughs> going into triage, going um, to in, in the evacuation and anything uh, associated with that. What we um, what we learned, what I learned, was that the advent of the helicopter as a uh, a use in the Korean War and then into the Vietnam War uh, gave troops a survivability rate of over 75 percent, practically. And as of today in the Iraqi and Afghanistan wars, it's over 90 percent. So the helicopter played a big role in survivability. Um, I uh, had many uh, opportunities to uh, ride in helicopters. One, one time I uh, had to shoot some aerial shots and I was strapped to the outside of, a, of, of one of the UEs and shooting my, my aerials. Uh, the soldiers in the, uh, in the helicopter said everything was perfectly safe, not to worry. I was <laughs> sitting on the struts, standing on the struts, strapped with what appeared to be very safe they were ammo belts tied together, you know, <laughs> and I might have been a second lieutenant, but <laughs> I did not fall off the turnip truck that day. <laughs> but at any rate, we, we got our shots. A, a lot of times we were, um, we would, I would follow soldiers from the, um, the, the triage area where they were first brought back by, by the medics. Uh, the, the, the corpsman, and I would see them later on in the field hospital. The third field hospital out by Tonson New Air Force Base outside of Sudan was, was my particular uh, hospital because as the, as the officer I had to do a lot of the logistics, so I got to be close to Saigon and that was the field hospital. And I, I remember one day walking around and I saw a familiar looking person coming towards me. And as he got there, I thought, my goodness, it was former Vice President Richard Nixon. And he was just walking around. And I, I had to go up. I said, sir, can I help you? And he said, I, I just want to see some of the soldiers. I'm here to say hello and, and wish them well. And so I, uh, I offered to take him around, which I did. And he just went to about every soldier he could and just wished them well. I took pictures, later got them to him uh, when I got back to Walter Reed. But that, <clears throat> those are the things that when I was thinking about what I had been doing, I had forgotten about that for years. And I know you, you talked about <clears throat> some of your experiences earlier. And I, I just, when Fred asked me about this, I thought, I don't know what. I can talk about it, but you just keep remembering these things. And I was talking to Chet earlier. You know, we, we are all aware of the, the IEDs of today. And back then, the IED that was in the soldiers' uh, heads then was something called a, a bouncing bedding. And it was, uh, for those of you that remember, it was a, a, a small grenade that was tripped and came up about mid level and caused extensive damage, but it, it was in soldiers' heads and that was the IED in, in Vietnam that I remember. Uh, one soldier in particular had lost his leg. I followed him back to the hospital and I later saw him back at Walter Reed and it was, it was a, a nice opportunity to, to reconnect and he was, he was just a, a grateful soldier that the medical services afforded him, got him back alive. And, so we're, we're happy about that. Um, what I didn't know um, at the time, what, one of the things that I would do is, obviously we all sent letters home. 
Um, so my letters were going <coughs> to my mother and father, my brothers, <coughs> and some of my cousins. But my uncle was a surgeon in the U.S. Army in World War II. So he had a definite influence on my life in getting into the medical, <coughs> medical services and the MSC when I was young. So I would send him cassette tapes of what I was doing, what I was seeing, and he said, please keep sending these. They were so enjoyable for him to reconnect. What I didn't know was he was sharing them with the whole family, so when I got back, some of the things that I had told him had gotten around for the whole family, and that was another way that you connect with your family when you're young. And it was, it was a very uh, touching thing to me. So he asked if I would share any of the, the movies that we had taken. And there was one particular film. It was a, about a 30-minute <coughs> documentary that was television quality, television quality. Um, and he asked me if I would show it to his Rotary Club, which I was happy to do. It had some surgical scenes in it, and uh, I think for some people it was a bit much, and, and some people were a little squeamish about it. And I really think his real reason was to show people who had not been touched by war the reality of war, and, and it did that. When I returned from uh, Vietnam, after about four to six months, um, the demonstrations had started in earnest, and it was something that I guess we all pushed down, sublimated, and forgot about. And I remember then in the, uh, the political election times in the 90s, it became fashionable to talk about regretting the opportunity to serve because of educational deferments, or sabbaticals in Canada, or things of that nature. And, and I, it just seemed disingenuous to me at the time. But this is a wonderful thing. And, and I thank you for letting me remember that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our next presenter is um, Chet Zabrowski. Um, as mentioned, he was in special ops as well as working on medevacs, and I am so glad he has his green beret on because once a green beret, always. Always. It's like a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Same way with the green berets. Uh, at this time, Vietnam veterans, if you would kindly please stand. Gentlemen, welcome home. In talking with Bob earlier, I, I mentioned the one film that I still remember about the VD films, the venereal diseases with little cartoon characters running around. Stayed in my mind. Anyway, uh, I entered the service in 1968, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was nominated to take the Special Forces battery test. I had no idea what Special Forces was until somebody said, that's Green Berets. And I'm thinking, oh, life expectancy, three weeks. That's it. But the sergeant that was there said, listen, you're going to go through eight weeks of basic training. You're going to go through eight weeks of advanced individual training. Then you're going to Vietnam. You're going to go to Vietnam fighting with a bunch of people who don't want to be there, talking about the American soldiers. He says, you could do that, or you could train with the best of the best that the U.S. Army has to offer. You could become a Green Beret. And I thought, hmm, my chances of surviving might be better if I sign up and get all this training from the Green Berets. My training would last about a year and a half, whereas a normal, uh, regular army soldier would, you know, eight, uh, I'm sorry, four months, that's it. So uh, anyway, I signed up for the Special Forces Medical Course. It was the hardest and longest course that the army had at that time. 
51 weeks of highly intensified medical training. I would be the doctor, not in a hospital setting, but in the field. When somebody yelled boxy, which means doctor, or corpsman, or medic, they would be the first people to go out and save that person's life or attempt to save that person's life. I've given this presentation several times already, you know, ever since 1977 to a lot of high school persons, and a lot of them thought, gee, I didn't know that, you know, medics could carry weapons, because in World War II they were considered non-combatants and were not permitted to carry weapons. So, of course, medics heard the call, corpsmen heard the call, they went out to save somebody and they ended up being killed. They couldn't defend themselves. That would change in Vietnam. When I went into the field, I went into the field just like all the other soldiers in my recon team or in my platoon. One with about 600 rounds of ammunition. That was priority for me. But anyway, back to my training. I was told psychologically the medical field will be the most difficult. Psychologically, how come? Our instructor said, when somebody yells for medic, know that every North Vietnamese rifle will be on you as a target. They know who's coming out. They know that the next person out there is going to be a medic. And if you can't handle that, being a target, get out of special forces now, get out of medics now. And I thought, I, I can handle this. Let's get trained. Anyway, I entered Vietnam in April of 1970, served one tour uh, in the Central Highlands, which is the tri-border area. For those who have a map, it's where North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and Cambodia meet. It is a hotbed of activity, a major offshoot of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, that supply route that came from North Vietnam down through Laos and Cambodia that the North Vietnamese used. Our missions, because I was a member of the MACV SOG, the Studies and Observation Group, a little misnomer, we would run top secret missions across the borders of South Vietnam that we called the fence, into Cambodia, into Laos, and into North Vietnam, when no other American soldiers were supposed to be there. Now, like most veterans, we have a story to tell. And my story, starts on 26 November 1970, that's Thanksgiving. On that day, I was a part of a hatchet force of 35 soldiers that were gonna go deep into enemy territory in Laos and on a 10-day mission, supposedly, look for POW camps, look for enemy base camps, Look for caches of weapons, look for troops moving down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That was our mission all the time. Anyway, the mission lasted three and a half days. I'm not going to bore you with all the things, but we made significant contact with the enemy seven different times. We were 35 people. The last 16 hours and this mission I called a defining moment in my life, not only as a person, but as a medic. I haven't said this too often, but when I was in the service, when I was in the military, when I was fighting in the field, I had never been wounded up until this time. 26 November 70 would change that. I had never been on a mission that we ran out of ammunition up until 26 November 1970. I had never had to treat so many casualties. Of the 35, there were seven dead, 25 wounded, and three somehow or other escaped without a scratch. I was the medic on that team. I had to take care of all of those people and fight the enemy at the same time. But the big thing was I had never been on a mission that I said to myself, you know what, Zabo? You're not coming out of this one. You're out of ammunition. You're in the enemy's backyard. You cannot get evacuated. 
not until the next day. For the next 16 hours, the survivors would escape and evade a battalion-sized, some 600 North Vietnamese soldiers. We would be escaping and evading from them. And this is with no ammunition. There are three people, three surviving Americans of that group. Our team leader, Ed Zebron, was put in for the Medal of Honor. Clyde Conkin and myself were put in for Silver Stars for Valor. Neither of us received anything. 35 years later, Ed Zebron, our team leader, who had been wounded four different times, his Achilles tendon was blown away, couldn't walk, had to crawl. That's why he was put in for the Medal of Honor. Not really, because he was the one who called in all the airstrikes. He was the one who rallied all the forces to make sure that we could survive. He was the one who picked the, the evacuation route for us. On, I believe it was uh, February 11th of 25, 2005, Ed Zebron received a Distinguished Service Cross, our nation's second highest honor. There are still people out there that are trying to get him his Medal of Honor, and so he deserves it. The other two surviving Americans, Clyde Conkin and myself, now the last time I saw Clyde, he had called for Box C, medic. We were in the middle of this two-hour firefight, starting from 26 November 70, he called for me, I ran over, and I noticed his face was covered with blood. I'm the team medic, I can take care of this. One of the things that they taught us in training is you look for an entrance wound and an exit wound. Why? So that you know what organs are involved. Well, when I saw him, at his hairline was a small eh, half to three-quarter inch hole that was spewing out blood. And as I held his head, and you know, tried to look a little more, I noticed that the back of my hand, on the back of his head, was also covered in blood. And when I looked, there was a hole about this big, blood spewing from the back of his head, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, entrance wound, exit wound, this guy is shot right through the head. What do I do? Now, he's still fighting, he's still yelling at the enemy, uh, the enemy is trying to outflank us while we're there. At this point in time, uh, I got wounded trying to treat Clyde Compton. But that was my last memory of him. When we evacuated the next day, 16 hours later, the helicopters were still taking fire from the North Vietnamese. And this is after hours and hours of airstrikes hundreds of North Vietnamese soldiers laying dead. They're still shooting at us. Some of the helicopters were hit, had to get diverted to different places. Some went to play coup, some went to Doc Peck, some went to Doc Siang, uh, others went back to our lawn site, Doc To. Clyde and I got separated. My last memory of him was covered in blood. In November, November 25th of 2012, I was attending the Special Operations Association reunion slash awards in Las Vegas, Nevada. Clyde was going to be there, Ed Zebron was going to be there, and a few other people. When I saw Clyde, now Clyde is about six foot tall. Great guy. Sat there, hugged him. I said, you know what? The last time that I saw you was 42 years ago. You were covered in blood. He said, hey, Zabo, you know what? I have a picture of that. So he actually gave me the picture, sent it over uh, in, in snail mail, and I got it, and sure enough, there's a, a hole about that size that the doctors had patched up. I said, how did you survive? He said, the doctor said I was the luckiest person in the world, because if it was a bullet that would have hit his head, he would have been dead, shot right through the brain. But it was a piece of metal fragment called shrapnel. Many soldiers get them that had entered his scalp, slid it along the top of his skull, and exited out the back of his head. Oh my God, I heard that. Yes. Now, imagine that you are the medic out there, and again, 
Medics didn't call time out when somebody was wounded. It wasn't like, hey, you know, stop. Didn't wear big red crosses. Didn't wear a helmet. Would have been, as a matter of fact, we didn't wear helmets anyway because they were too heavy. Didn't wear flak jackets. Mike uh, would know about those things. You sat on them. They were just too darn heavy for us. Much rather carry some extra ammunition. Oh, by the way, the, the Marine that was here, is he still here? Because I wanted to personally thank him for his service because I saw a lot of people with his types of injuries. And he mentioned something about the, the, the rucksacks that he carried, anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds. Yes, that's what we carry too. Because I not, no, not only had to carry all of my ammunition, my weapon, my grenades, I also had to carry all the medical supplies which was IV solutions, medicines, morphine, bandages, tons of bandages. Uh, but that is my story. And when people say, how did you survive? I said, well, if it wasn't for Ed Zebron, Clyde Conkin, and the rest of us, and all of the intense training that we had, we should not be here today. So I thank those people Ed Zebron, Clyde Conkin, the rest of the members of my team, some of them who have passed away. I am here because of them. And I am here also because of all my instructors that told me, you listen to me, I'm going to tell you the things that you need to survive in Vietnam. I thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, uh, General Abrams, if you're here, I know I broke a military rule by wearing my gray inside, but I am really proud of this, so I'm wearing it today. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Um, Mark C. Neuendorf will speak next, um, Lieutenant Colonel Neuendorf, and um, she told me at lunch, just like many others, she never talked about her time in Vietnam um, as an OR nurse, seeing many, many, not only men, but women and children come through the OR as well. And she just finally, as an agreement with her daughter, started telling her story. And I, I think that is something that we all need to do um, because it helps with the healing. So thank you very much, Marcy. To all of you that have or know of someone that died in a medical unit in Vietnam, I want to tell you that they never died alone. If someone made it to us, someone that wasn't on duty was there for them. We stayed until they made it to heaven, but we never ever let them stay alone. And I just want to make sure that that word spreads because I know that when I have talked to people that say that a brother, or a, a brother or a father died in Vietnam or a son, that they say, you know, I just wonder how his last days were. Well, I can tell you that if they made it to us, they never, ever died alone. My name is Marcy Neuendorf, and when I went to Vietnam, I was Captain Kidd, if you will, believe that. Um, my father was in the military. I have a brother that was 11 years older than me that was a MACV advisor in Vietnam at the same time and a brother that's three years older than me that had just left Vietnam about mm, four months before I arrived. I went to school because I have six brothers and I was the only girl under the Army Nurse Program that paid for the last two years of your college. So I went to Florida State University, um, was sworn as a PFC um, two years before I was to graduate. And then six months before I graduated, my father commissioned me with the second lieutenant bar that he and my brother had both worn. So, as you can tell, I come from a very big military family. I was bro brought up with America, pie, America apple pie and motherhood. I, I had so much support, and that's the reason I asked the question earlier today. I was so lucky. Um, my in-laws-to-be, who had never met me, sent me care packages. The people at ch church sent me uh, birthday cards. One 
moment when we got mail one day. There was 52 pieces of mail and I got 45 of them. And they, they were all birthday cards from people. My mother was the president of the Episcopal Women of the Church. And they asked her, what, the, what can we do for your daughter, you know? She's so different than the men over there. And she said, don't oh, just send her a birthday card. Her birthday is two days after Christmas and she thinks it's special. So it was very special that year for me because I knew I had support. In the OR, we saw a lot of injuries. And I'm going to tell you two, maybe three stories, depending on how much time I have, about what I consider the will to live, or in one case, the will to die. We had a, a young boy, 18, 19 years old, that came in and had to have an amputation below his knee, only one limb. And to those of us that had been over there for a while, an amputation below the knee for one leg was not that significant because in less than a year, he'll, he would be able to, with a prosthesis, be skiing down the slopes in Colorado like he did two years before. But for this young man, it wasn't worth it. The troops from his platoon had brought over his letters because they had no idea that what, what was in it was a Dear John letter. That young boy was told by his wife that he, she was pregnant with his best friend's baby and that he, she wanted a divorce. That night, the nurse said, there's something going on here. He's just not responding as we usually do. I'm going to ask for a psych consult. But at 2.30 in the morning, that young man coded and died and passed away. He had nothing to live for. Us nurses, cried a lot that day. It was Christmas Eve, and someone died because someone was so foolish to send a Dear John letter to someone in Vietnam. I'm not sure it still happens today, but I hope it doesn't. Another story is Will to Live, and this one is much more successful and much more enlightening. <coughs> Had a young soldier coming through the OR, I was sitting taking a break. I think I'd been on my feet for about 9, 10, 11 hours, I don't know. And um, I was drinking my Coke and I heard someone saying, quick, come on, you have to, ha have to open the chest, come on, Mars. And I'm thinking, couldn't possibly be talking to me because I've never done an open chest in Vietnam. i had never done an open chest anywhere. I didn't even know what they were going to do. The Three nurses that had been in there a long time who were doing chess knew that, but they were all busy. So they just yelled at me and said, Marsh, you can do this. Easy peasy. Yeah, easy for them to say. So I just dumped all my instruments on the tray. They poured um, betadine over the person. I need to tell you, this person was in a gurney with the doctor straddling him and holding his heart and chest and blood was coming everywhere. And Rabbit, that's what we called him, and Dr. Og, because he was the king of everyone. <laughs> Dr. Og was the anesthesiologist and said, oh, come on, Mars, just do it. So as we were going in there and we were uh, sewing up some of the arteries and the hearts and I'm finally figuring out that I can do this, um, we get through it and the doc says, I need to look underneath the heart to make sure that he hasn't taponotted and that just means that the blood vessels have closed and sure enough we found a couple of more bleeders. Mm -hmm. That young man, 10 days later, walked to the helipad to get on a helicopter to go to Saigon, to go to Long, to go to Lonstuhl, Germany to meet his wife and his newborn twin sons that he had never seen. He was going to make it come heck of high water and he did. I guess one little story I didn't tell about this is that as we're almost done, the doctor had to go to another case and he told me, oh, just sew up this thing, you can do this. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't, I don't suture. Never had, but I did that day. He said, it's just easy. Take this little Keith needle, which is just a long sewing needle that has suture to it, and just sew down this way and then sew up this way and don't dog ear it. Well, I did dog ear it, but it was sewed up and the man didn't mind. He was so alive and so ready to see his sons. Excuse me. <clears throat> 
One more story, and then I'll go to just some personal stuff. We had a young man come to us who had been stepped on a mine and was blown from his waist down. How in the world he lived from where this happened to be flown to us, only the Lord knows. But he wanted ice water, he wanted a priest to, to give him last rites, and he wanted someone to write a letter to his wife. And he did all of those things, and then somebody held his hand as he went to heaven. That was the will to live. I'm sorry. <laughs> My experience in Vietnam was the year that I grew up. As I told you before, I came from a very religious family, six brothers and me, and apple pie and motherhood. My mother said to me that I always had rose-colored glasses and only saw the positive thing of everybody. Well, in Vietnam, I realized that not everyone was as lucky as I was. Not everyone had as much support. I got a care package at least once a week. I got notes and letters. I was lucky enough to um, get engaged in Vietnam, in Hong Kong and R&R, &R, and have my wedding dress made in Hong Kong. That sounds a lot better than, oh, you went to R&R &R to Hong Kong when you say, oh, I got engaged in Hong Kong. <laughs> so, um, and I married him just a few, uh, two weeks after I got back from Vietnam, and we've been married almost 44 years in October. So ours worked, and um, that's about all. Would, you've got some stories about other uh, patients that you treated in, in the OR. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because when you talk about nation building, um, our medical teams didn't just take care of our own. We took care of everyone that walked through the door or got wheeled through the door. If, I, I don't know if all of you saw the pictures, but the one picture of me with the fly swatter is when we were taking care of a North Vietnamese prisoner. We, if they were wounded, we took care of them. If they were sick, we took care of them. One of the things that I've never seen in my life and hope never see again was a case of the black plague on a young lady, a young girl, where their urine is just black. And um, the one thing that the Vietnamese families do is when they come, when their child or their loved one is in the in the hospital, they come baggage. They just lay in the bed with them, and they stay for the whole time. And we took care of children. We did the cleft lifts and the cleft palates. We did um, amputees. I have pictures in the stories that I tell when I talk for about an hour now. I've finally been able to do that. I, I show the pictures of the uh, prosthetics that the Vietnamese people have for their children and how they're working with them, because some of them get injured too. Um, my mother, on Christmas, sent me a whole bunch of Christmas candy to give to the children in our hospital, and they just loved it. So we didn't just take care of our own, but we did take very good care of everyone. Thank you very much, Marcy. Our next speaker is Christina Kaufman, um, who serves veterans and their families those who are trying to navigate the system and the organizations providing uh, support. You heard this morning that there are hundreds of organizations, and that is quite a quagmire when you're trying to get something. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to start the same way everybody else has, which is a, a heartfelt thank you um, to, to this generation that I'm speaking to. Um, for every one of my husband's six deployments, you were there. Every time they came back, you were there. Um, I don't think that there are words to describe what that meant for us. Um, you, you all truly did stand by that motto, never again will another generation abandon uh, another generation of veterans and family members. So I just want to let you know that we felt that. And, um, and, and, and how much we appreciate that. So welcome home to you all. I also uh, wanted to give a, a shout out to all the military 
spouses, wives in here today. Just like there is an unbreakable bond that is forged on the battlefield, um, there's a special bond forged between the family members and the wives and the spouses at home. Just like I will hopefully never know what it's like to go to war, you all, if you're not in that position, will never know what it's like to be left behind. It really stinks. It, it, it's really, really hard. Uh, the first panel talked a little bit today about, you know, being shot at, being wounded, seeing seeing their, their, their friends die. I know that it wasn't like that all the time, right? There are times where you all were safe. But as a spouse, the entire time, we're just waiting for that knock on the door. That's what it feels like. And then with this generation of families, it happened over and over again. Like my husband, like I said, went six times. So you never really get a chance to take a breath. The best way I've, I've been able to explain it to, to my civilian friends who really just, it's hard for them to relate. It's like when, when you're driving down the highway and you see a cop car in the rear view mirror and you see the lights flashing and you get that in, in your stomach. It's like having that feeling for 10 years straight. That, that's kind of like what it feels like. So to, like an example that happened to me in my husband's first deployment, this is early on. Uh, it's amazing how communications have just changed in the, even in the past 10, 12 years. One of his first deployments, um, he had gotten a sat phone from one of the reporters and he had called me for the first time, it was like four weeks after he got there. And so I'm of course very excited and talking on the phone and about 10 minutes in, I hear a huge explosion and the phone goes dead. Right? And so then I just sat there, at that time the, the, um, the news uh, was covering it 24-7, sat there watching the news with the curtains open waiting for the chaplain to come. Now, of course that didn't happen, thank goodness, um, but, but that's the kind of stuff that I think that people don't realize uh, when you're on the home front that you're dealing with. Um, so the bond that I feel with all military spouses, regardless of, of when that service was, really was, it really is a strong one. And if I can just ask our, my military spouses to either stand or raise their hand, um, just so you guys can be recognized like the veterans, that would be terrific. We, we truly do stand on the, on the shoulders of those who have served before us, and, 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 I, and I mean that for, from the bottom of my heart. Okay, so with that, I'm going to focus my remarks on what happens when war comes home. We've talked a lot about um, the battlefield response and the, the incredible, uh, really, things that, that happen um, you know, to, to bring people home. Uh, but, but for some people, some veterans, and therefore their families, um, the battle doesn't stop on the field, uh, and, and, and war comes home for, for many um, military veteran families, both back then and now. Um, I am just one of an entire generation of military families that really know nothing but war. I met um, my now former husband, the only place a girl that went to Berkeley could meet a guy that went to West Point, Las Vegas. <laughs> the rum jungle, apparently what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay there. Um, but I, uh, so I was married June of 2001. Matter of fact, I went from Berkeley, California to Lawton, Oklahoma. That was my first duty station, which was a culture shock for me and for Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> and I, I was actually speaking with my ex-husband the other day, we're still very close, and in the 12 years that we were married, we were actually in the same place for three of them. Uh, and that's not unusual anymore. I think that's one of the defining differences between my generation of, of wars and any other generation is the repeated deployments. We simply don't have any idea what that has done to an entire generation of not just veterans, but family members. And really, like I said, never really being able to relax. Um, Occasionally I'm asked if, if the war, or wars, uh, are responsible for the breakup of my marriage. And to be honest, I don't have the perspective to answer that question. Because I don't know what marriage uh, is without war. Uh, and like I said, you have an entire generation now that are dealing with that. So a few statistics. 
Uh, 2.5 million, approximately, troops have deployed since 9-11 over the past 13, 14 years. We have the most married military we've ever had. Back in, uh, back in the day, it was, it was more of a single guy's game. Um, I know with the Army, somewhere upwards of 58% uh, of, of, uh, of the Army is married. Um, 2.3 million children have had a parent deploy uh, since 9-11. Since um, you've already heard that an estimated 23 veterans uh, take their lives every day. 17 of those are the Vietnam era veterans. Uh, estimated 15 to 30 percent of returning veterans are struggling with the invisible wounds of war. And as General Salisbury said, that's somewhere upwards of 600,000. That does not include the family members that are impacted by that. Of the 23 million veterans that are estimated to be living in the United States today, only half of them, only half of them actually qualify for VA services. And only half of those are using it. So imagine what would happen if everybody that actually needed it or qualified for it was, was using it. So here are the numbers that we don't know. Uh, we don't know the numbers of spouses and children and family members who are struggling with their own mental health challenges as a result of war. Uh, the Army officially started tracking suicide and attempts around 2008. They have a tool called the DOD Suicide Event Report. So every time a, uh, a military member um, either attempts or commits suicide, there's a protocol uh, that, is, that is meant to collect data and inform efforts going forward. There is no such tool to track military family member spouses because they're not doing it. Although, I will brag for a minute and say that after years and years of us um, uh, up on the Hill, we finally got Congress to require uh, DOD to start tracking uh, suicides among family members, so we're really proud of that. Um, I personally know, just one person, three Army wives that have taken their own lives, and two children. I'll tell you a story about one of them. When we were stationed at Fort Bragg, it was, uh, my husband was in battalion command from 06 to 08 during the surge. And excuse my French, it was a shit show. I mean, what was going on at home was so, it's one of those things where, you know, I'm sure it's like this in combat, you just put your head down and you do it. it, it the amount of craziness that, that was going on with the families, with, with, with responding to the, you know, the, the combat, issues on, uh, in theater and what was going on with the families was just nuts. And it was, there's a lot of pressure put on spouses, particularly um, career officers and NCOs. Uh, it, the, the system that they have to kind of take care of families is very heavily reliant on, on senior spouses. And so here I was in a position of some kind of authority, not necessarily because I was qualified to do it, but because my husband was the commander, which is a pretty stupid model when you think about it. Uh, but th that's what happens, and that's what it is. So, you know, we did the best that we could with what we had, which wasn't a lot, no money, basically, and 20, you know, volunteers who were 18 years old is what I was working with to support about 1,000 family members. So there was another battalion commander's wife that lived around the corner um, from, from me, and during, um, my husband, I think, was in Afghanistan. Her husband was in Iraq. And I came home one night, and I saw some police activity in the neighborhood, and, wondering what that was, and I woke up the next morning and turned on the TV and, and it said that there was a woman uh, in my neighborhood found dead in her home with her two children. So later that day I found out that um, another a fellow com uh, battalion commander's <laughs> wife, uh, Faye, um, had put herself and her three-year-old and her three-month-old in the car, turned it on, and, and killed them all. And I remember having the thought, Jesus, I, we need to talk about this. And I didn't. And I didn't because I didn't know how, and there was a sense of shame for even thinking about talking about it. Everybody was kind of whispering behind their hands. Um, and I didn't really know how to address it. And I regret that to this day, because I had an opportunity as a battalion commander's spouse to actually raise the topic of you know, depression and anxiety and all the things that, that most of us were facing. Um, and and I didn't do that, which is one of the things that pushes me today um, to, to speak openly about it. So for 
there are approximately five million military family caregivers in this country today. Some of them are probably sitting in this room. About 1.2 million of them are from my generation, post 9-11 generation, right? So a caregiver is basically a family member or a friend that is providing some kind of care for someone who, a veteran who has been impacted by their service. The VA established a caregiver program uh, a couple years ago, it was actually signed uh, by President Obama, which was great, right? It basically provides some level of support and health care and um, a stipend in some cases for these wives uh, to, uh, to, so that they can take care of their husbands and a lot of them can't, a lot of them can't work. So 1.2 million post 9-11 caregivers, there are 16,000 people in this program and it's not going to get any bigger. And by the way, you can't get it unless you're post 9-11 caregiver. That means that we have an entire population Let's see, about 98% of family members of veterans are not going to get services from the VA. Okay, 98%. So if you look at the numbers and you say 30% or so of, of service members and veterans are coming back with some kind of negative impact from war, and that number is somewhere around 600, 700,000, triple that to, to include the family members. Where are they getting help? They're not. I would argue, and, and Faye's probably a good example of this, that the stigma that, that persists on the, on the service members and the veteran side of the house of even getting help is just as bad, if not worse, than it is on the spouse side. Because I will tell you, there's an enormous amount of pressure to keep yourself together. Because if you cannot keep it together, then what is your loved one going to do over there? They used to actually tell us what to say and what not to say. There's a great thing about being a military spouse nowadays that you can actually talk to your husband or your wife or whoever's over there, or you can Skype with them, you can do all these things, which isn't always a great thing, <laughs> right? Having that communication all the time isn't always a great thing, because what do you say? You know, we had some people telling us, don't tell them anything, and then they come home and your whole life is, <laughs> you know, turned upside down. So trying to balance that is, is, is tricky. So I just wanted to, to make sure that we talked a little bit today about the fact that there is collateral damage, I consider, the families, our casualties of war as well. And we are not providing appropriate care for these families. And this is not acceptable. It wasn't acceptable what we did with your generation of veterans. Um, you guys didn't have anywhere near the amount of support, as General Salisbury uh, pointed out, that we do. The tragedy would be here that 40, 50 years from now, my generation of military families is seeing a lot of the negative outcomes that the Vietnam veteran generation is seeing now. As Alan pointed out, most of the suicides, the homelessness, that's mostly Vietnam veterans. What a tragedy it would be that we have all of these resources and because we can't get it together as a support community that we see the same thing happen to my generation. So there is a silver lining here, believe it or not, like to end on, end on the positive. One of the silver linings is that we're actually talking about it. This is not, this is pretty new, that, that we're actually having conversations about mental health, about PTS, about traumatic brain injury, and about some of the things that are, that, that are facing our community. And by the way, mental health is not a military or veteran problem. This is a problem that this entire country has. It's almost one of the last stigmas to talk about, of, of, of making sure that when we talk about mental health, it's no different than if someone was shot, they go get care. If you've had some kind of mental health, uh, something kind of traumatic happen in your life, you get care. That's where we need to get to as a military, and that's where we need to get to as a country. And I actually think um, that that's happening now. We have a model on how to do this wrong. We learned that lesson on the backs of this generation. So I'm really hoping that as a country, we will not repeat history. I always like to end with a call to action. 
And so although you guys have all certainly paid your dues and, and are enjoying your retirement, I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> if you uh, know any veterans, particularly of your generation, who are struggling, please send them our way. Alan says we don't, uh, we don't publicize too much what we're doing because, you know, until we raise more money, we can't grow our capacity. But I'm comfortable sitting in this room because we want to try to get that Vietnam, um, those numbers for our organization up because we know those people are out there. Uh, www.codesupport.org. Uh, just give us a call or contact us and we will help them. Also, everybody should have a little brochure on their table. In that brochure is an actual copy of the Code of Support that General Salisbury and, and some of his um, friends uh, developed in which the foundation is founded. Uh, you can read that, you can go on our website, you can sign the code, and you can dedicate it to whomever you'd like. You can dedicate it to a veteran, a military family member, a service member um, who has served in, in any generation. Um, and, and let people know, we're trying to get a lot of people to sign that code of support. Finally, if you're interested in, in learning more about what we do and how you uh, might get involved, we're always looking for volunteers. There's always uh, things that we can that we can put people to work. Trust me, um, and we will do that. So thanks again for giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys today, and 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 truly um, for the veterans and the military uh, wives in here and spouses. Thank you for your service. Okay, is it dinner time yet? No, I'm the anchor man, last man up. Um, I, like Marcy, uh, joined the Navy when I was in college, and I joined in 1971, which was not a very popular time in our country to join the service. Um, I was on a nursing scholarship, and my recruiter used to come and pick me up in civilian clothes. And I would have to sneak into the NROTC unit because I reported through them. And we had protesters who would find us on campus and, you know, have all these signs and, and so forth. So I graduated in 1973 from Boston University. And uh, I went on the buddy program. I, I talked my roommate into joining with me. And so we got orders to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Now, when you're in Boston and you look up Jacksonville, North Carolina in 1973, you couldn't even find it on the map. So we left Boston in 1973, and of course all the guys had hair down to here. From the back, you couldn't really tell who was a guy and who was a girl. And we drove into Jacksonville, North Carolina. And I thought I fell off the face of the earth. It, it, the, um, the men looked totally different. We actually drove into downtown Jacksonville, North Carolina. And if you know anything about Jacksonville, North Carolina at that time, and of course Doc over there knows all about Jacksonville, uh, North Carolina, uh, we drove into downtown and we rolled down the windows and a police officer walked by and said, young ladies, what are you doing? And we said, well, we're in downtown, you know, we're looking for the shops. And he says, where are you going? And we said, well, we're, we're reporting to duty um, at Camp Lejeune. And he said, you two ladies, lock your doors, roll up your windows, and don't stop until you go through the gates of the base and don't ever come back here. <laughs> well, you know, the town was tattoo parlors, dancing girls, strip joints, uh, pawn shops. Uh, it, it, was, it was really a battle zone. So it was a different kind of, of a battle zone. And I had a wonderful experience from 1973 to 1975 because we had the opportunity to take care of all of the returning Marine Corps POWs. They came through, Jack, many of them came through Jacksonville um, for their physicals to be reunited with their families and of course many of them had still 
many, many uh, healthcare issues. So it was truly a, a pleasure to be able on at the very end to take care of individuals whose families hadn't heard from them, didn't even know, know that they were alive. As mentioned, um, military families really have it difficult. They've always had it difficult. Um, I didn't come from a military family other, other than my father serving. Uh, my brothers never served, and when I was having a change of command uh, at the National Naval Medical Center, the Marine who was escorting my brother up the aisle said, well, sir, did you serve in the military? I know your sister's up there on the stage. And he goes, oh, no, my brothers all sent her. <laughs> um, but I, I uh, served for 32 years, and my husband th served for 32 years in the Navy. So we were a dual military family. And there are many, many dual mil military families. And, um, and, and that's tough, especially with deployments. My husband used to always call me a good Navy wife. Except when I, as a commanding officer, needed help with many of the issues that my families were facing, or a dinner party, my <coughs> husband would say, what do you need? And I said, I need a good Navy wife. Am <laughs> <laughs> I missing something here? So, as mentioned, um, I am on the defense Health Care Committee, which is a committee of the Defense Health Board, and we were commissioned by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense to study amputee care. We made huge, tremendous gains um, thanks to what was recorded during Vietnam uh, in amputee care, but we're terrified that we're going to lose it. I'm going to give you a little bit of history because amputation is an age-old war um, consequence. In the Civil War, and we don't know how many survivors we have had over the past wars uh, because there are no uh, rec existing records, um, but in the Civil War there were 21,000 amputations. In World War I, there were four, over 4,000. World War II, over 15,000. Korea, over 1,000. Vietnam, over 6,000. And Persian Gulf, 15. And Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and for those who don't know this, Operation New Dawn, um, to date, there have been 1,626 amputations. Um, as I mentioned, it's very, very difficult to determine the survival rate. However, in the Civil War, 75% um, of surgical op operations were amputations. Um, amputations were associated with high death rates, obviously be because of the poor conditions. Um, they really didn't even have operating rooms. They had tables and saws. World War I brought a, a renewed focus on advancing uh, amputee care, along with the establishment of rehabilitation programs, which we had never had before. And that's thanks to um, the medical care in Great Britain. Um, the, the Brits actually helped us establish uh, some type of a rehab program for our amputees. And then World War II served as a catalyst to reinvigorate uh, DOD's efforts to improve amputee care. The Korean and Vietnam Wars brought the introduction and widespread adoption of the use of helicopters that was mentioned for rapid transportation of the war wounded. Um, transportation sank from 15 hours during World War II to some type of a field hospital to one to two hours during Vietnam, and that went down to well under an hour uh, 
uh, during OIF and uh, Operation New Dawn. The lessons that we learned from Vietnam were establishing specialized medical treatments in pods in different sections on the ground, uh, incorporating rehab principles early on in amputee care. Once they have left that first operating room table, and they weren't done, some individuals have had 100 surgeries. Uh, but we started rehab right after that first surgery. The other thing we found was limiting convalescent leave because when we let people go too early out on convalescent leave for long periods of time, we couldn't get them back into a good rehab program. The other thing was better defining the VA's role in taking care of amputees. And then the last, I think, but the 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 best thing that we discovered from uh, Vietnam was providing holistic and team care uh, to these men and women. Um, the VA um, a system of care which is best embodied by the Veterans Health Care Eligibility Reform Act of 1996 requires the VA to maintain its capacity to provide specialized care for patients with amputations and other disabilities. But um, as again what was mentioned is the VA does not take care of a lot of individuals including some amputees who still need that care. What happens now though? During times of decreased conflict, during times of peace, we turn our focus away from advances in amputee care, advances in trauma care, and we turn our, our focus into that everyday peacetime health care and health maintenance. Um, too often, though, in military medicine, we have to scramble at the last minute, and we found this starting with OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom. We had to scramble because our surgeons did not know how to take care of amputees again. The VA could say they knew how to take care of amputees, but they really took care of elder amputees. Amputees who had already had been treated during Vietnam, or amputees who um, were an amputee because of diabetes or other types uh, of medical conditions. We did not know how to take care of trauma and gross trauma from IEDs uh, with our amputees. So what did we do? Um, the Army immediately took charge and established Walter Reed as their primary amputee center. And after we got some experience through Walter Reed, we established three centers within the United States to take care of amputees. The first was at Walter Reed, and then it moved over to the National Military Medical Center, uh, and that was uh, MATC, which is the Military Advanced Training Center at Walter Reed now. The Center for the Intrepid was established in San Antonio, Texas, and the Comprehensive Care, uh, Comprehensive Combat and Complex, Complex Casualty Care, the C5 program, was established um, in San Diego. You know, the Civil War, they, gave they built prosthetic devices during the Civil War. Um, and they were wooden legs, wooden crutches, metal hooks, um, and we have come a long way, baby. Um, the experts in the field right now suggest that in the near future, amputees will actually shop online for <coughs> prosthetic advice, devices and attachments, just like you shop online for shoes. <laughs> um, these men and women are running, they are skiing, they are surfing, they are rock climbing, they are fishing, and most of them now are living in homes without any special accommodations because as part of their amputee care, they, the model apartments in all of our centers that are set up for them do not have grab bars, 
do not have low beds, do not have special types of showers. They are set up just like a model apartment that you would walk into anywhere or a hotel room. Um, so these young men and women have to learn how to deal with their injuries and their prosthetic advices in normal circumstances. Think about it. If you're a double amputee, how do you learn to get on an airplane? How do you learn to use that teeny tiny bathroom that's about this big on the airplane? They begin teaching them from day one when they hit the hospitals. Um, Special Olympics, Special Olympics has really um, come a long way. We have many individuals now involved in the Special Olympic program. One of the quotes that um, I wanted to uh, share with you is uh, one that we captured when we did many of our interviews uh, with these young men and women. We traveled throughout the country interviewing them and their care providers and their teams. And it, it's the extraordinary character and the will of the amputees and their families are indispensable components of the achievement of unprecedented positive outcomes. The motivation, determination, esprit de corps, perseverance, and attitude of the amputees and their families has shaped and revitalized the quality of care provided by the Department of Defense. The families have given up everything to really try to heal with their wounded uh, warriors. Um, they have taken a great impact and um, many of them have readjusted their lives. But do you know what? You heard from um, uh, Sergeant Kevin Hoffman this morning. It's that young warrior and their family that actually pushed Med, med, military medicine to develop new standards and new care. It wasn't the providers who were pushing these young men and women to get better. It was these young wounded warriors who were pushing us to come up with new advances in care because they were saying, I want to get out of bed and we were saying, well, we don't have a wheelchair designed and they were saying, design it now so I can get out of bed or design this, or how about, have you tried this? I think it'll work for me. So our researchers and the individuals actually designing prosthetic devices and other types of medical devices are actually sitting at the bedside with these young wounded warriors trying to come up with new advances in medical care. That's a huge leap for military medicine. And our fear is that we're gonna lose it. Um, because even if we send our um, young physicians and nurses into the civilian sector to treat the train wrecks that come in in the emergency room, they are not the same as the battlefield injuries. They are, you know, miles apart. So um, our subcommittee was charged with trying to figure out how we are going to not just preserve um, this level of care and quality of care that we have, but how are we going to advance it for that next conflict that comes up? Certainly, body armor has helped, and you know that they are continuing to develop all types of protective gear for our young men and women in the battlefield. Um, but can military medicine keep up? with the injuries that will come in. I don't know, we're still studying it. We have made recommendations um, to the Secretary of Defense and hopefully we will preserve that capability and continue to advance. So at this time, I would, we have some mics here at the table, I would like to open it up to our entire panel for questions and answers. We've got some mics out there um, at the tables so if you've got something that you'd like to share with our panel or any questions that you, if you would like to ask us, please feel free. 
Candy, if I might, two, two things occurred to me. Um, one about the uh, amputees going away from rehabbing and, and needing to get them back. That's a lesson we all should listen to because uh, still being in long-term care and doing short-term rehab for our seniors and elders, it's the people who want to go home before their care and rehab is done that end up back either in the hospital or back in, in rehab with a worse morbidity. So if I can take anything from that, so if you have find yourself in a hospital or in a rehab center, don't leave until you've finished your rehab. You'll end up back there again. And, and whether it's a young person or not, you, you need to finalize the medical care plan that's been done for you. Also, Chet and I were looking you were talking about the, uh, a lot of the uh, current uh, uh, armed forces are married versus World War II and perhaps Vietnam. We were looking, the average age of the soldier in Vietnam was just a little over 19. The average age for uh, the military today is a little over 26, so there is a significant difference in, in age at the time. Uh, first, let me say that was a wonderful panel. I do have a question for you, and I'm sorry I don't know your name. But how does the suicide rate, which I'm very interested in, compare to the general public rate? Is it very much higher or the same? So, um, that's a great question. Uh, before 2001, um, being in the military was a protective factor against suicide, as in if you were in the military, you were less likely than a civilian to commit suicide. Less likely. That is no longer the case. So the number, and, and again, this is just for who we measure, which is not the family member, so we have no data on that. Uh, so the number has continually gone up and now has pretty much drawn even with or maybe outpaced um, uh, the civilian uh, rate. Um, it's my understanding that the veteran suicide uh, rate has always been higher than the general higher. civilian population. Um, but when you're actively serving in the military, it used to be a protective factor. Um, the numbers that we have, you, you know, in, in the support community, you have to go with the data that's out there. Just, to, just so you all know, the 20, that, that number of 23 estimated veterans that take their own lives every day, that's from the VA, but it's really only based on 22 states, um, uh, the, the, the CDC and the death registries. It's one of the challenges to data collection and one of the reasons why it's actually difficult, uh, even more difficult, to track family member suicide. Uh, at least when you're active duty, like if you're an active duty spouse, you have to have a Deers card, right? So you, there is a way to track it. Um, it I think part of it, uh, some of the, what I can consider excuses that I've heard from leadership uh, as I've been pushing this issue um, has been that, you know, well, we don't own the spouses. She could have fooled me, but, um, you know, we, we, don't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't own you, so we can't, whatever. Um, I just think it's more difficult, and I also honestly think that it's a Pandora's box that they don't want to open. Um, and, and, and I think that's very short-sighted, because even if you don't, even if you're going to say, you know what, that's not our problem. Military families aren't our problem. The leading causal factor in suicides in the military is broken relationships. That's the leading causal factor. The second one was if you had some kind of military punishment or legal issues. But the leading one is breaking up with your girlfriend or the Dear John letter or whatever it is. So the Army had a report a couple years ago that identified that. And I was up, uh, General Corelli, who was a great um, advocate for, for soldiers and families, a couple years ago was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. And I was talking to him um, right after that report came out, and, and I will say, the report was very, really well done, and the Army really was pretty transparent, told some very powerful stories about how they had failed. But I said, you know, I don't understand how you can identify something as leading causal factor and then have no recommendations around 
supporting the mental health of military families. So I think it's just a, a, a problem that we have in, in treating families holistically that you pretty much, you know, you get a soldier, you get a wife or a, a parent or whatever, and as one goes, so does the other. What we have found in my experience is if the soldier goes down, the family usually goes down with them and vice versa. Thank you very much. We will uh, conclude our symposium and we'll t we will take a break. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule, so why don't we take a 15 minute break until five minutes after three and then we will uh, reconvene uh, with a fabulous film. <laughs> <laughs>